games have evolved to be a whole compelling narrative. They tell a story and you're immersed in a story. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of my interview series in conversation with. Today, I have a great, great pleasure to announce uh, Phyllis Angkruk, who is going to be joining us to talk about game localization and especially uh, localizing in English Chinese language pairs. But before we jump into that, I would love for Phyllis to introduce herself and tell us a little bit more about her. And very, very interesting factoid here for you, Polish speakers, our Polscy koledzy and koleżanki. Phyllis has got very strong ties to Poland, but she's going to tell us about this in a moment. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, or should I say, cześć? Cześć. <laughs> awesome. Yes, okay. So my strong Polish ties actually is uh, because I used to, I used to teach um, English in Poland. So I, through that, I actually got to know a bit of the interesting, you know, quirks that Polish speakers have when they speak English. So, of course, I married, um, you know, Boski Hopak, you know. <laughs> Moje marz. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm, I'm hoping. learning all these stories <laughs> that I learned. Phyllis's yeah. husband's hello. That's a very, very high praise. I don't even call my fiancé Boski Hopak. So well done. You're doing something right. Really? Uh, no, he likes it more when I call him Przystojny. And this is like, what? Oh, <laughs> that also works. That also works. Yes. So, yes. Um, so I, I taught in Poland for a bit. Uh, I, put, I thought English and um, then that's actually how we actually started a little bit because while I was teaching English in Poland they, they were like oh Phyllis you, you're from Asia teach me something Asian <laughs> <laughs> and I was okay. just like okay <laughs> because they didn't know like what type of Asian but you know the most common type in the end you know is Chinese so I was just like okay um I'll try to teach you some Chinese lessons and uh, at the time I wasn't really trained in like you know how to teach Chinese it was just like this language that I had growing up it was like suddenly one day if someone comes up to you it's like teach me Polish and you're like oh, oh no oh thanks no your brain would just go Poof. so actually after that experience I taught a few like conversation lessons then I decided to actually when I when I go back to when I went back to Singapore, I was just like, OK, I should actually take this a little bit more seriously, because even randomly, people are so interested in the Chinese language. They see it as such a great advantage in the global market nowadays. So I thought, OK, I'll just go get my teaching diploma in Chinese as well. And that's what I did. I was like I was had a full year of studying everything after eight years of not speaking Chinese, wow! eight whole years of not wow. speaking any, I was just like, okay, now suddenly everything for a whole year, it was like texts, essays, notes, everything was all in Chinese for a year. And then I got my teaching diploma. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Very challenging, isn't it? To just kind of go, because it's, I mean, this is academic language we're talking about. So it's, it's yes, quite a specific yes. type of communication, isn't it? it was, wow. And it was Cute actually... Us. I think I think it was actually it helped a bit that uh, I had English teaching experience because I was like you know I am familiar with the concepts of teaching already I know where they're going with this mm -hmm. so I can see the end game you know like what it's supposed to be for versus you know if you just keep reading the text and you're like why am I studying this what does this have to do with the actual <laughs> yeah. world so I could actually see the applications behind that and that made it you know more it had a greater purpose for me in the sense you know because I know what it's for so from teaching there's been quite a big leap to localization walk us walk us through that because I'm, I'm sure this is quite fascinating uh, oh, yes. journey <laughs> so again there's another location change my husband got an offer to to work in Switzerland so it's a German-speaking country and, you know, I could teach um, English and Chinese in Switzerland as well. But the problem was that uh, I think they expected your German to be about a, at least a B2 or something. So you can explain lesson concepts to the students. And I was just like, 
no, I've got to do German. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing to do on the list to do. I was like, I was like, oh no, nafatelnia. Yes. I'm already like, I've like so many in my hands. <laughs> I'm just going to have more. And I was like, oh. And, and so I was just like, okay, now I have, I've like really, um, native level english and near native chinese levels um so i was just thinking like okay what can make use of two languages and that's where translation came in so i was just like ah translation that's good so when on pros that's one of the first few sites that i went to see and they are like at the at that point of time there was a high demand for game translators right and it seemed relatively easy to get into because it's like Every other day, they were they were like you know game translators need it like Chinese to English translators for games need it blah 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 and I was like it's just coming in a flood right I was just like oh this this is interesting so I just applied to a few of these agencies and I think the process was quite uh, fair because they're like here's a test and you pass the test to be accepted into their freelancer pool. So it went from there. I was just applied and I was like, oh, I passed. I applied to another one. I passed. I applied to another one. I'm passing tests. Okay. Something is good happening. Yeah. I'm like, I'm I'm picking the right boxes, you know. And yeah, so, so it started from there pretty much after applying and really just putting myself out there to to just try my hand at it so this is quite a specific uh, area of, of localization games tell us are you i'm guessing you are a gamer i mean i'm not i don't want to basically give anything <laughs> everything away uh but i am I'm, I'm guessing that you're an avid gamer yourself and if so what kind of games do you like to play and what kind of games do you like to localize i wouldn't say i'm a hardcore gamer i was um, more like um casual gamer so back when I was a student right, we had was the computer labs and everything so all the students would just quietly download counter-strike <laughs> <laughs> yes in, it was in, like, po in Polish we have it we actually have a special name for that Kanterowcy so people who who, who hardcore played counter-strike and uh, there was actually a very famous <laughs> mean this is by the way how old I am so you know if, if, if anybody I'm, I'm, I'm old too come on <laughs> Yes, those memes and films kind of roaming the internet about someone just going, you, beep, 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 what are you doing? Someone playing Counter-Strike, you know. Oh, but, yeah. is it the, I mean, my, my, my Polish students censor themselves, they say, Karczak, and it's like, mm, yes, <laughs> I know what let's you go mean. With let's go with that. Yeah, yeah let's go, lots of Karczak. <laughs> <laughs> So that was like, um, I think one of these, the, the most famous MOBAs and um, the really old school games would be the Diablo 3 series with the expansion packs and everything. Those are fantastic. And of course we have the classic Pokemon. So you, you, I kind of grow up with all these game things which are like iconic. So I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm a hardcore kind of gamer with super quick reflexes and going to championship leagues or something. Yeah. You know? I think um, if I'm going to play with young people nowadays, my reaction time is kind of slow and they'll just call me a potato. So I'm like, oh. <laughs> potato. That's <pretty> yes. good. <laughs> Because you're like, there was one well, time it was like, you're not fast enough, you're not strong enough, you don't have a problem. You, know? you just like dare as a, a teammate that kind of does okay, but not has, but doesn't have like great impact. So you're like, hey, you're a potato. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll take it, I'll take it. Okay. Something. Potato is a great, great vegetable. You know, it's yes. very useful. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think I think it takes a certain you know certain skill to to play Fortnite and you know like do yeah. do esports. And I'm a, I'm a casual as I do like to like play different games multiple times. I think mm -hmm. uh, Bioshock's one of my absolute favorites. I think I've played it about five six times. Oh, my my fiance would like find me on the couch saying, like, "You're doing Bioshock again?" I said, "Yep, I'm I'm finding all the <laughs> all the secrets." Uh, but yeah so, so are you are you the type that goes for all the side quests before going yeah. for the main one yeah yeah, yeah i will okay, it's so yeah, much fun yeah. so you have interesting games so tell us about what games you like to localize um well okay because the source language i translate from chinese to english and because of the source language is, is chinese the biggest profit um that the Chinese market gets is from mobile games. 
So most of my work has been for mobile games, occasionally one or two PC games, or if they do a simultaneous release for mobile and PC, I work on like both mobile PC localization. Um, and I, I'm an in-house translator slash freelancer, and I work in-house for Tencent. And Tencent is uh, China's biggest uh, biggest game producer, uh, game publisher and producer, actually. So it's pretty much I'm giving support for whichever project they have that needs support in English. So we've got the, the managers in charge of projects. Sometimes they're like, OK, we've, we've got this batch of um, text here. We need help with proofreading it. We need help to verify if this, this uh, grammatical change is correct, whether it can be used in this context, blah, blah, blah. And then I help out with that. OK, so, yeah. so th this this sounds like a very extremely varied uh, list of tasks, because am I Obviously, I don't want to, you know, you know, compromise your NDA, but are you allowed to choose projects that you want to work on? Or is it a case of whatever they send you, you need to pick up and, and work on? I don't know. Um, it's, I'm kind of like a, a freelancer, a contracted freelancer in a sense. Okay. So it's kind of like if they send me this amount and I have the capacity to take it on, like the agreed, we agreed upon this certain uh, capacity, and if it fits, I'll be like, yes, I can. And if it doesn't, I'll be like, yeah, it's impossible. Then there's no way I can finish this in six hours or something, you know. Then it is, it is up to me to kind of like advise and and tell them like, no, actually, I can't do it right now, but it, we can do it by this time, something, something. So we just re, re we kind of negotiate how the the deadlines can go. And so far, so far, um, there hasn't been any deadline that I couldn't meet because, you know, it's all been very reasonable so far. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's good to have that bit of a give and take. Tell us about the differences between working freelance and working in-house, the main differences between the two. Well, I have to say that uh, it could be the speed of uh, responses from the developers the project managers so sometimes when you send a query in as a freelancer right you send a query in you have a specific sheet a query sheet that is sent to the developers and it gave it back to you and that back and forth can take i don't know maybe 24 hours later or oh, wow Yes, or, or it could be like 48 hours later, you know, like if, if there's a time difference, they send it there, they send it back, then you only get your answer two days later, but you have to, you have to hand in the text by yesterday. So yeah, <laughs> so as a freelancer, well. you've got these, this delay here. Okay. Yeah. And as an as a in-house uh, translator, you could be like, you know what, if I can't reach this team, there's also another person who knows about it. Then you've got you've got many sources to ask and clarify things, and um, because you're you're sort of like part of the company, yeah. right? They can share they can share more documents with you as well, so you can get clarification quicker, and uh, you can also, you know, um, suggest fundamental changes. So, for example, if you find that um, there's something here in the style guide that has not been made explicit. And then you, you notice that the vendor is making this kind of grammatical mistakes and all that. So while in proofreading, I was like, no, this, this should not be a colon. This should be a comma. Mm -hmm. you know, or this should, you, know, you shouldn't use a semicolon here. You should use uh, an M dash, you know, things, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just like report it to the project manager who then like reviews it and is like, yes, that is true. We need to make this standardized because you don't want the game to have all the different punctuation marks for the yeah, same thing. It looks, it looks sloppy, it looks doesn't it? Yeah. Weird and terrible. So they then they add it into the style guide, right? And then make sure, try to make sure the vendors like, please read the style guide again, comply, let's standardize everything. So we're just trying to trying to streamline the, the game overall. Okay. Yeah. And what is your do you have a preference? Do you prefer to be freelance or do you prefer to be in-house? Or is well, it is it kind of a bit of a balancing it, act? It really depends on the client. <laughs> because um, I mean, as as in house so far, I think for these for this company for Tencent, they've been very nice. Um, 
And it's actually also my, my first time being an in-house translator as well. So it's just kind of like, I'm just enjoying the experience. <laughs> and um, so it's how, how, how long have you been with Gunsend? Um, since Jan January 2022. So okay, okay. so that's, that's quite, quite recent. Okay. Yeah. Ish. So kind of like, you know, it's, it's nearing December now. So like 11 months so far. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's been it's been very nice. Um, I think the, the problem as well is that um, when you're a freelance, you have a whole variety of clients with like weird demands. Some of them have really really strange demands, right? And some of them are just really really great to work with with a, a very nicely fleshed up team, very well balanced, clear communication. Right, and they handle many um, aspects. Like if you work with agencies, right, they have they handle many more aspects of interacting with the direct client. So there's a buffer between between you and them, but also it's a needed buffer. <laughs> how how so? No, I mean because direct clients can be very 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 um, unreasonable in some aspects. Okay. Yeah, because you, you know that um, you tell them, hey, I'm, I'm translating here. This is what your source text says, right? This sentence. And then you translate it, this sentence, to the target language. And it's a simple sentence, right? Hmm. Something like, he walks out the door. Okay. Okay, then you write down, he walks out the door. So some clients, what they do is like... <gasps> Oh, I'm not sure. Am, am I paying for a human translator or is it a machine? And then they enter the simple sentence into the machine translation oh, to check. Ah. To check. And then they check it and they're like, it's the same output. Right. Are you are you trying to scam me? You're gonna charge me this amount and you give no me the way. same output that he walked out the door. Uh, I demand a discount. Uh, ha, ha, ha. So there you go. <laughs> not gonna, not gonna happen. So, so uh, you, you have cases like that, or, or they'll be like, you know, actually, uh, this sentence is too plain. So, like, I want you to make the sentence more jazzy because you are localizing the game. So he walks at the door. Let's make it more cool. He sachets at the door. <laughs> yes. And, so, and you're there with like this big question mark. I can't read your mind and turn walking into sacheting, you know, because the source text says this, but suddenly they want that. And you're like, I finished the file and you're telling me this now. <laughs> so, well, yeah. was it was it a RuPaul's Drag Race game with sacheting away or? or no, 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 it's just no. a made up, made up example. <laughs> Fair it's just made up because um, um, NDA and all, I can't. Yeah, so it's, of course. It's like, no, a made up course. scenario but yeah. you do have uh, if you you do work with direct clients they they do try and do some weird things so if you have an agency working as a middleman they help mm -hmm. to cut out that idea right they talk to the client first and you're like sir are you sure you want this changes so you have not specified this in the contract we have to charge more something yeah. something so if you have an agency in between they help you negotiate that okay but if you're just a simple translator and you're handling the client directly and you're throwing this at you you kind of have this feeling right you're, you're kind of like mm. if you're not good at business negotiations you're going to get trampled down on you they're going to just bulldoze you and get as much out of you as possible if you're not nice people you know that's not the right thing to do really because not everybody is a negotiator and uh, you know right. you need that you need yeah. that basically correct me if i'm wrong if you have pr uh, your own clients you're not just a translator but you're also a pr person in a way and you're also a, your own pm and mm -hmm. i don't know about you but i hate managing myself and uh, i'm much happier <laughs> if someone does it for me you've you've mentioned uh, that your language is uh, that your language pair is uh, english and chinese and i think you would be very chinese, chinese to into english english only, only. I, only. I don't go the other way you know <laughs> the, the, obviously the, the two languages are vastly different uh, mm -hmm. so tell us a bit more about the main challenges of, of translating from uh, uh, chinese into uh, into english i think it has to do with the source texts of course um 
And the thing with a lot of game translation, uh, texts used in game translation, is that um, it's written by people who need to get text out quick, you know, for game updates, things like that. They are in a high stress environment when they write it, so they make typos, type the mistakes. And because Chinese is such a, a tonal language, so when you input the wrong word, it might sound the same, but they input the wrong character. So you read it and you're like, this doesn't make sense. Oh, okay. Because meaning, meaning wise is totally different. So if you encounter typos like that, it can be very, very confusing. And on top of that, uh, some of them, the, the text, the source text is not very well written half the time. It can be full of factual errors as well. Okay. And it can also, like, for example, if it's based in folklore, things like that, they could could or could not be well researched. Yeah. And, and you know, with the added complexity of the language as well, they could be all like, uh, sometimes they, they have some, oh, this is fantasy and we'll base it off, like, let's say, Norse mythology. <gasps> But then we'll change the meaning around a little bit to suit our narrative and also do a few tweaks to the names so that um, it's it's nice for us or something like that. Or, you know, they, they actually use the name, but they type it kind of phonetically because they hear like, oh, I remember it sounds like this and they type it in and they don't fact check. So you've okay. got something that sounds like it, but when you search for it, you don't find the actual god in the mythology, although they mean that god. So there is a lot of, um, I should call it Chinese to Chinese translation. Intralingual, yeah. Yes, in your head before <laughs> you can get it to English. All right, first you've got to figure out what they're writing about, what they intend to write. So basically, it's kind of a little bit like trying to read their minds a little if they're not writing it very well and also predict what it might be, then you translate it. Then, all right, you also send in a query to be all like, is, are you sure this is what you meant? All right. So, um, and one thing about these typos, so to speak, is that there was one time um, they entered a term and this term was like specifically, it was like four characters and there's two characters that fit something that was already in the term base, but the other two do not match at all. They do not match phonetically. They do not match character wise. And I'll just assume like, okay, this sounds like it's a totally new skill. I'm assuming it is because that's is so much, it's so very different from what's already in the, the term base. So I sent in a query anyway, just to make sure, like, is this a new skill? And they, then they came back with the answer and they said that, actually, no, this is that skill that is totally different from what they wrote. I'm like, oh. <laughs> How are you supposed to know? <laughs> send in a query. Send in a, like, and like w one week later or one yeah. month later, you get the yeah. response. Do you have access to the game before you localize it? Is that something that you, happens or do you get a mm. lock kit that's well researched and, and well put together or how does that work for you? You see, it, it varies. That's the okay. thing. It varies. So I think if the, on the side of the developers, if they have good file management, they're able to give you the information quickly. But if they are not good at file management, right, you have cases like that where your glossary is not even finalized and they've already launched a game. I think there was even a game where in the source language, the name was something in the source um, that's like, I don't know, Amy or something. So that's why I say like phonetically, it's like really Amy. But then the game itself, right, in the game itself, the published game, her name is Betty. Yes, at the source, like phonetically, everything it says Amy 100%. But in the game, they changed the Betty, and I was just like, why does the name not match? And they're like, oh, someone somewhere decided that the name sounds nicer as Betty. So that's, we went with Betty, even though everything in the source text says Amy. So you have these kind of like brain boom moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you can see the mess it is in the source text, right? Sometimes you have to unravel a lot of this mess and then translate it to English. And this is actually a very, very important text because lots of game companies use the English translation as the pivot language. The English translation is the source text 
for translations into FIGS, French, Italian, German, Spanish. So yeah, that, that's, that's really, really complicated. So if you don't get the translation right in the English stage, a lot of it can be compounded into the other languages when it's translated to the others. And so, what kind of, is, it, is, is there a standard of, of gaming English that you translated to? You know, is it British or is it American or is it request specific? It's request specific. Most of the requests are into American English. Okay. Most of it. And uh, once in a while, I get requests into British English. So I can do both. So it doesn't matter to me. Just just tell me which one you want to use. <laughs> this puts quite a lot of responsibility on you because your text will be like the beacon for everybody else to yes. localize the game. So how do you approach that kind of a, that kind of a challenge? Uh, my process is be good. Okay. <laughs> this is really much, this is really much all, all you can do, really. I'm just like, you, you have to ask, you have to be, be and, um, I mean, don't be shy about asking questions, really. I mean, don't be afraid of looking dumb because really these things are not obvious, right? Like yeah. the thing about the, the typo I told you about, where yeah. it seemed like it wasn't, it wasn't like that at all, but it turned out it was. You need to ask them. When they are not clear, you need to ask them or you could request more information, something. Try to make it better for everyone else down the line. I mean, as a professional courtesy, Right. But of course, if you're paid well, you do it. If you're not paid well, I don't care. <laughs> <Okay>. You know? <laughs> so it, it, I think you're always managing be- expectations, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It depends on the translator. So then you've got some companies who want to save money and they ask you, can you work on machine translation and post edit, edit MTPE oh, yeah. for games? I'm like, you're insane. <laughs> Just a bit. I think a lot of people don't appreciate that games are artwork. This is my personal mission, vendetta, you know, against downgrading the status of games. I think the more you game, the more you realize that it's not just a dumb type of entertainment for children and teenagers, but, you know, it can be quite a complex visual and oral and textual experience yes. and uh, I think MTP for I mean, games it, it cannot I, I don't think it can fully express the, the kind of uh, feelings that it's trying to convey in the scenes because games have evolved to be a whole compelling narrative they tell a story and you're immersed in the story Right. And then you you play when you progress through the game, you grow together alongside the character. So it's really not just a game game anymore, especially if you play uh, things like, OK, I'll quote the recent God of War. Yeah. Right? The God of War game with the whole immersive storyline. Right. And there are scenes in, in games as well that have made people cry because they have connected. You have connected with the character so deeply at some level. Right. And games are also being used to raise awareness for issues, right, as well, as a, as more as a medium to reach out to more people. And because of these universality of games, you know, like where everyone's like, oh, we see it as an easy entry for some difficult topics as well. They can actually also get a little bit political. For example, if you've heard of the game Papers, Please... Have you heard about no, it? No, 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 no. I haven't. Okay, so it's a made up. You, you are a passport controls officer in. Oh yes, I've read about yes, this. Yes, 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 yes. I remember. <laughs> and now, it's yeah. just a made up country, and then you're like, they are presented with all this information every day, and the rules change every day, and you're like, do I approve this person? Do I let them out? And then it actually, you know, there's this kind of like, the, it's a bit like the trolley problem in psychology, right? Like, do I let one person in? Do I not experiment. for the mess thing? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a whole, it makes you feel so much. And and yet it's such a simple game, you know, overall you think it's simple, but it's so much deeper. And then you've got that yeah. uh, aspect of that Zimbardo experiment because you're in a position of power and you are given, you know, that it's, it's yes. really, it's really, really interesting. Um, I, I love interesting. I love the point that you made about universality because gaming is just something that's so universal and accessible. Mm-hmm. You know, you could be Polish, you could be Estonian, you could be Chinese or, or German, and you can still experience the same story, albeit in a, in a slightly uh, different way. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insight. That was what that was quite beautifully put about, you know, the game experience. 
So security is a really big consideration for you because I, obviously you have to protect the... Mm-hmm. You have to protect the IP, yes. I mean, professionally, of course, if you have this, if you feel responsible, right, because as members of the CIOL, right, we have to uphold certain standards. For me, right, I would like to adhere to it as much as possible. I mean, I know that some translators don't really care. They're just like, you know, I'll just sit in a cafe, blah, blah, blah. They don't or care. the train. <laughs> yes, or the train or where ever and they're mm. like oh that nobody's gonna look at my screen anyway so of just course like, they will 100% you know? they will like for me as well I can't work in uh, in public at all I think the only thing that I can do really with my laptop in public is write articles which will be published but yeah, yeah it's very important true. yeah especially because you are an interpreter so you can't really have your conversations in the middle of a coffee house I have this studio and uh, nobody comes in here but yeah for, for you all that needs to be considered when it comes to security security just to follow that up on that do you have like a system for security do you have uh, insurance do you have all that taken care of as well um i think it's actually part of business registration in switzerland okay so oh, i do i do have i do have liability insurance because it's part of you know um i have a sole proprietorship business here in switzerland so i'm like a registered business we have a vet number and everything yeah, yeah. me up so it's, um, it's- Everything is very official for official. me here. So yeah. I am following all these rules and things and all that. So in my case, yes, um, I have these insurances. I have steps. I have codes of conduct that I follow. But you, you have to keep in mind that not everybody does this. Not everybody would be a member or consciously follow the rules as a member of the Chartered Institute of Linguists. But I'm interested, yeah. just to round it off, uh, that's very interesting that you mentioned the CIOL and being a member uh, of a professional organization because that's something that's very dear it's a cause that's very dear to my heart and I believe in being a member I believe in having some external guidelines for conduct for your do's and don'ts so if you could just tell Mm -hmm. us in a few words what support and guidance you get from the CIOL well I think what it does mostly is that um, being a member helps to verify that you are trustworthy in terms of quality to a certain degree right because um, some companies actually do go through the list the find a linguist uh, kind of search and find your profile and reach out to you because of that so it helps in that aspect and they mm-hmm. also have the library. So for certain things that I'm interested in, I could have access to the video library and like, you know, attend some free events. Sometimes it's just the updates from them via email. I'll see like, oh, there's this and that going on here and there. So you know that the industry is not dead, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. actually hopping with events and things that yes. you can participate in. It's great to hear that, you know, members yes. get things out of it. I do really like the webinar library as well I think it's it's got some brilliant stuff there I would love to talk more but we've been uh, yes we've been discussing so many wonderful and interesting things thank you so much for your time Phyllis it's been wonderful right. having you uh, on my thank you uh, for, series thank you for inviting me to speak that's, so that's my I, pleasure I hope, I hope the listeners have learned something from my rambling <laughs> going on and on about uh, things that we do in localization and I'm sure that um, the other localizers in the series also share some of my frustrations yes yes definitely. yes yes so i'll share some specific ones on like you know going from in my head going from chinese to chinese then to english i think a lot of the issues that stem from the source text actually do mm-hmm. get passed on to the other languages but um i think that also is important to get someone who is highly qualified highly competent and able to do the job to make English the pivot language. So game companies out there, please, please, no machine translation. Get a human translator who can do the job well so it does not cost you more down the line. Absolutely. Like um, uh, one of our, one of the brilliant colleagues, uh, Alicia Tokarska, whose um, big passion and interest is inclusive language, mentioned a game in which uh, one of the characters was non-binary. The Polish localizing team is quite um, unfortunately and they basically chose to completely erase that aspect of the game they 
completely omitted the fact that the person was not identifying as being male or female. I don't know whether they were genderqueer or neutral or, or gender fluid, but this completely disappeared in the localization. You know, I think this is something that really needs, you know, needs attention and needs pinpointing that a human is able to, because you're not just translating the text, it's almost like you are recreating a new, you are creating a new entity on the basis of which all the translations will be then created. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of even more more responsibility. Yes, game localizers, please hire Phyllis to make sure that you've got the best quality uh, content. Thank you so much again, Phyllis. Thank you so much for, for coming to my, to my <laughs> show. Um, maybe I could persuade you to say goodbye in Polish to our Polish viewers and listeners okay. oh sorry know, put you on the spot the very, <laughs> I know very the very simple one is okay like, do widzenia oh brilliant do widzenia, do widzenia. Awesome. okay <laughs> thank you uh you can say uh, thank you in Chinese please don't please don't kill me uh xie xie. Xie xie. Xie xie. Xie xie. okay xie xie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I just I said oh yes and thank you too for inviting me to your program thank you thank you so much Phyllis Bye. thank you bye-bye bye-bye bye-bye